what does occupational licensing uh, and and what are, why should you care about this other than to get a haircut? For me, uh, not having much hair, the difference between a good and a bad haircut is about two days. So uh, it really doesn't matter to me that much. For many of you, it's a much more important uh, issue. Uh, so one, this is a, a book uh, that I've written uh, that's gotten a, a fair amount of attention. Uh, and for, for many of you in the business school, the, the price is right. You can download it for free uh, at, at the Upjohn Institute website. Uh, there's a PDF available, and if you want to know more about uh, this particular issue. The book was written so that you could read it on a, on a moderate size plane ride, sort of between Dallas and Minneapolis. You could probably get through most of it. So, uh, but it'll give you some of the key points that I'll be talking about and goes into more detail about these issues. So what is occupational licensing by government? Well, one of reason I'm here is innovation. So but in prehistoric times, which I guess this cartoon sort of suggests, you have a policeman giving uh, this person who's inventing the wheel a, uh, a ticket and uh, bringing the heavy hand of the law upon him for coming up with an innovation. Uh, in this case, he's a wheel maker, perhaps without a license. Uh, and uh, that, that licenses by government, one of the perhaps major issues, is that it does tend to reduce innovation uh, and entrepreneurship, which I guess is one reason uh, that I was asked to, to talk to you about this topic. What is it and does it matter? Well, what, what is it? And, and certainly one can think of certification and other forms of regulation. But when you think about uh, occupational licensing, what does it serve as a substitute for? Are there other mechanisms? Are there other institutions in the market that allows you to take care of perhaps someone providing you with a, a bad good, someone who's unscrupulous or incompetent providing you a, a service that you don't want? Are there other mechanisms other than using the police powers of the state, which occupational licensing does. Well, first there's market uh, competition. Uh, if you don't like that haircut, you can go to somebody else. Uh, you can also litigate if someone is saying they're providing you a service that isn't appropriate. Uh, there's, if someone is saying there's a bait and switch, they're saying they're providing you one type of service and they give you another one, uh, you can go for, uh, there are a lot of government agencies, or you can uh, use contract law to say they said they were going to provide you A and they gave you B. You sue, right? Uh, that's why we have so, so many lawyers around. Uh, inspections. Uh, so if, uh, if you're going to a restaurant, uh, that restaurant may have been inspected, but almost none, uh, in fact, I would say none of the cooks who are providing you that service. Certainly, if you had lunch today, uh, the person who prepared that lunch probably was an unlicensed individual. Yet, the restaurant uh, or the kitchen was likely, uh, was likely inspected. Uh, bonding or insurance. So oftentimes, there'll be uh, many, uh, uh, a company, a, a roofer, or, or a plumber will be bonded so that if they don't provide the service they say they're going to, you can go after the fact that, that they are insured. If a tree trimmer uh, cuts down a branch and it falls on, uh, on your parents' uh, garage, uh, they can sue uh, that tree trimmer if they're bonded or insured. Uh, also, there's a form, something called registration. Many states have this. So there's registration by uh, the government that says these people are on a list. Some of you may have used Angie's list. So these are people who are on the list. If enough people complain, they're taken off the list. So you only know the people who are on that list provide uh, a good enough service that people aren't complaining. Uh, certification. Certification. 
And this is where it gets more regulated. Certification is a right to title. Somebody can only use that title if they've met certain criteria. So there are chartered financial analysts. Only those people who have passed the exams and done certain uh, tests can call themselves chartered financial analysts. But other people can provide those services. You can go to your brother-in-law to set up a trust. Uh, or you can go to someone else. They can compete in the market, but they can't uh, call themselves a chartered financial analyst. And finally, there's licensing. And licensing is the most, it uses the police powers of the state. So it's a right to practice. So only those people who have met certain criteria can provide those services for pay without being arrested or severely fined. So there's a lot of some definitions that you kind of have to know before we get into some of the details of what does licensing mean. So you can uh, start out with market competition, the invisible hand of market, those of you who've taken economics, uh, start out with the invisible hand and that sort of provides one form of, uh, of regulation. Uh, consumers provide those regulations all the way down to licensing where the government uses its police powers to say people cannot provide those services under penalty of imprisonment or fines. And that's what licensing is. So it's along a continuum. So uh, I, I mentioned the idea of licensing as a guild. I, I, I guess I would lose my academic credentials if I didn't sort of give you a little history of what, where, where did this come from? Well, going back to the, to the Middle Ages, in Europe, service providers uh, had strong incentives in small areas to get together and keep others out. So if you were a blacksmith, if you were a baker, uh, only those people who were members of the guild could provide those services. And they typically got together with the, with the mayor and others to keep others out. And this served as a barrier to entry for uh, their professions in order to raise wages. So uh, if you weren't, only certain people were members of the guild and the guild members and politicians could collaborate to capture a bit of what are called economic rents, that is excess profits, more than enough that would keep you just in business and redistribute it to, at the expense of the rest of the economy. So uh, guilds often were, if you were of the right gender, if you were of the right religion, if you had the right social status, you could be a member of the guild. If you weren't, you were an outsider, and the guilds used that ability to capture rents for themselves. Now, when did the guilds sort of, if this is such a good deal, what caused them to disappear, or largely disappear? Well, it was the Industrial Revolution. There was a movement away from services in small towns, to large enterprises. So you had bigger uh, factories and rather than having the members of the guild determine who could work, the members of the uh, manufacturing establishment decided who could work. Uh, and rather than going to the government, they were the ones who would decide who could be hired and who was fired. So it really reduced the ability of the guilds to uh, be able to control entry and as a result uh, have economic rents for themselves at the expense of others. So the ability to control markets was much more difficult after the Industrial Revolution. So uh, workers in, in, in the enterprises did many of the same tasks established by the enterprise and there were no, and as a result, there were no longer any need for these guilds. So in these largely industrial manufacturing economies, occupational licensing or guilds largely disappeared. And that was part of the manufacturing society. So uh, what can we learn from the guilds and have they fast forward to 2017, uh, have these guilds reappeared? If you've ever seen these uh, Fright Night Freddy movies, uh, Freddy always, they think they get rid of him, but, he, but the monster always uh, 
comes back. So you'll see some of the guild sort of reappearing. So why is it important? Well, it's important in the US because it reduces access. And uh, this is an issue why this has been an important topic for both conservatives and liberals. For, uh, for liberals, it's an issue of access. The limit entry and as a result, low wage individuals, people who are, who are not connected, have very limited access to certain jobs. They're fenced out. Uh, it affects wages. Uh, consequently, if, uh, just as it did in the old guilds, those people who were able to capture the market for themselves were able to raise wages for themselves. Uh, wages, especially in the service economy, show up in the form of increased prices. And what effect might it have on quality? The sort of thing that Dr. Bradley talked about in terms of the good haircut. So what's the long history of examining occupational regulation? And I'm going to give you some comparisons, not only in the US, a lot of you study international business, but the fact that licensing is an issue worldwide, not just in the United States. So here we go. What's been happening in the US with licensing? I would lose my guild card if I, if, as an economist if I didn't show you data. So uh, the green line uh, up there is really what's been happening to unions in the United States. In 1950s, unions were about a third of the US workforce. And, they've been, and they were really centered in these big enterprises. The United Automobile Workers uh, were obviously in, in autos. Uh, there were uh, steel, uh, United steel, steel Workers, uh, machinists, all were in manufacturing. But as manufacturing has declined from about half of the US workforce to now about 14 or 15 percent, unions have declined in addition to many other reasons the internationalization and globalization are certainly uh, other factors. On the other hand, the red line up there is the growth of occupational licensing. And licensing uh, is focused in the service economy. The service economy has grown steadily after World War II and now is the dominant uh, w place where people work. So the thought experiment is Someone in the 1950s who's a steel worker is now your personal trainer, right? They've moved from being a manufacturing to uh, being in the service economy. And we'll get into that now. Uh, as Dr. Bradley mentioned, uh, I've done some work with Uber, and I'll throw some, uh, some uh, int perhaps interesting stories about Uber as well. So why is it important? Why should you care? Well, it's important for the economy. Uh, because it's a, it's a much bigger part of the U.S. labor force. Unions in the private sector are about 6.7% of the U.S. workforce. Uh, overall around 11%. Minimum wages only affect 2-3% to of the whole labor market are paid the minimum wage. Licensing is between 25 and 30% of the U.S. workforce require permission from government in order to work. You, if you don't get permission from government and you provide the service for pay, you end up going to the big house. And I don't mean this place, which is very nice. Uh, you end up going to a, a nice penitentiary somewhere if you provide those services. So what effect does it have? So when you control, when analysts control for education, human capital, licensing raises the earnings of individuals who attain it. People who get the license uh, by between 10 to 18 percent dep depending on the time period and the methodology used and it has no effect on inequality. So those are, it doesn't tend to reduce inequality. One big issue uh, for the economy is uh, the difference between earnings between the rich and the poor and does if licensing maybe raises wages but uh, reduces inequality that might be a real positive statement for this particular institution but the analysis doesn't uh, suggest it has much effect in in fact if anything it's slight it might increase inequality so uh, given that it affects a quarter or more of the workforce 
It also is all sorts of occupations. There are over 800 occupations that are licensed in at least one state, and we're going to cover some of those, uh, from frog farmers in North Dakota uh, to manicurists uh, to dog walkers. So there are all sorts of occupations that are licensed. When you include registered and certified, it's 1,100 occupations. I doubt we sat here for a day we could come up with 1,100 occupations that are licensed or registered. Uh, but only 65 or so occupations are licensed in at least one state. So uh, there, there's very few occupations that are universally licensed, but lots of occupations are licensed at the state or county or city government. So those are some uh, issues. So uh, in Louisiana, here's uh, Monique Chavon, and she's with her dog and has a beautiful bouquet. Well, that's because she is a licensed florist uh, in Louisiana. Uh, and it's important uh, that florists, at least in Louisiana, think uh, that florists should become licensed. Uh, certainly Valentine's Day is coming up, and if you showed up with an ugly bouquet, uh, you could, uh, your boyfriend or girlfriend uh, could break up with you. They could be even madder. They could uh, throw something at you and hurt you. So it's a health and safety issue. So uh, for all those reasons, uh, and the fact that there might, that at least the initial reason was bugs and so on could get in the flowers, uh, they licensed florists in Louisiana. Here are some of the other licensed occupations. Personal care, wig specialist. You wouldn't want to get an ugly wig. Again, you could break up with a boyfriend or girlfriend. Hair braiders. Shampoo specialist, you didn't know you were engaging in a licensed occupation this morning in the shower. Uh, that's uh, shampooing your hair. Uh, and athletic trainers. Uh, also, flora and fauna, land surveyors, florists, as we, caught, we covered, dog handlers. You wouldn't want Fido to be just with anybody during their walk. Uh, and lawn care specialists, locksmiths window installers and others. Uh, you see the, uh, the old wrestler, World Wrestling Entertainment, that's the Hulkster. Those of you who remember, that's Hulk Hogan. Still makes the news for different reasons these days. Uh, but uh, professional wrestlers are licensed. You wouldn't want a wrestler who was up there who was unregulated. Uh, so these are just some of the occupations that are licensed. That, in other words, you, if you don't get permission from government, you, are, uh, you could go to jail or be fined severely for providing these types of services. So we'll get into some of this. There's a great deal of difference across the country. Iowa uh, licenses, it has the highest percentage of its, of its workforce have attained a license. Uh, that's largely because insurance adjusters in Iowa uh, are required to be licensed. Uh, Nevada is licensed largely because of gambling and other nefarious activities that take place uh, in Nevada. Uh, so they are heavily regulated. But on the other hand, South Carolina is the least regulated. They also, by the way, have the uh, smallest percentage of unionization. But they're very heavy into manufacturing. Lots of plants have moved uh, there. So they're uh, of the states are very heavy into manufacturing. And they also have the smallest percentage of licensed. And going from the least to the most, uh, North, South Carolina has a little over 12%. Iowa has, uh, all, has thir more than 33%. So there's huge variation across states in who has attained a license. So that it's, it, it, but it, there's no very clear pattern in terms of who's licensed. So how did this happen? You got some of the data. How did this happen? Well, what, what often happens is occupations, people provide the same kinds of services. Uh, for, for example, physical trainers get together. They're providing the same kind of service. They say uh, they, mem they belong to a, a private organization. They say, we should be licensed. We know of unscrupulous uh, and uh, uh, incompetent physical trainers. We, it is really important that these people, uh, that only the best become physical trainers. So they get together, they tax their members, they go to the legislature, uh, 
and they pick individuals who might support their cause. They provide financial support for those legislators. They knock on doors for those legislators. They go to the governor and say, have we got a deal for you? You license physical trainers and uh, we'll contribute to your campaign and better yet, it won't cost the, the state government very much to regulate. We'll have maybe a $40,000, $50,000 bureaucrat who regulates personal trainers and each physical trainer will pay three to four hundred dollars a year in uh, licensing fees that will more than cover the cost of regulation. You can use that extra money for whatever pet project you want, Governor. So that uh, tends to be how uh, a lot of these occupations are, and why, and one of the reasons is occupational licensing is growing. More occupations are seeking to become licensed. Uh, one occupation are inter interior designers. They've uh, got they become licensed in four states. Again, the argument is health and safety. You walk into someone's living room, the drapes are ugly. You could have a heart attack. So health and safety uh, is an important reason. Uh, they make many other arguments, but certainly the, that may be one of the reasons for licensing interior designers. Uh, respiratory therapists in Illinois are, uh, organize themselves and raise their profession's dues in order to lobby for licensing laws and the ones who did this were much more successful. So uh, what ha happens historically? Well, among the first occupations, certainly you wouldn't want brain surgeons not to, to be unlicensed. Well, in fact, uh, uh, someone who uh, uh, does OBGYN could, be, uh, could provide legally brain surgery uh, services. Uh, someone who uh, deals with children uh, in terms of runny noses could provide brain surgery. Once you're licensed, you can provide any kinds of services. But going back to when doctors really were able to restrict licensing uh, was going back to, to 1911. During that period of time, uh, doctors uh, organized a number of openings in medical school. They established that as a criteria. Uh, there was a study done a number of years later by Milton Friedman and Simon Kuznets, two people later won the Nobel Prize, not for this work, but they found that doctors were able to dramatically increase their earnings relative to dentists who didn't put on these restrictions. So uh, this medical education, and currently uh, doctors, rather than uh, restricting entry as much to medical school, restrict the number of residencies in the U.S and uh, foreign doctors who come to the US from countries like Canada or the UK are unable to get residencies and consequently if you don't get a residency you can't get a license. So there are all sorts of bottlenecks in terms of uh, how occupations restrict entry. Well does it uh, protect health and safety? Certainly I've been giving you some perhaps uh, off the wall examples but uh, in Michigan it requires uh, almost 1,500 days to become an athletic trainer, but it only requires 26 days to be licensed as an emergency medical technician who handles heart emergencies and strokes. Uh, the maybe 1,500 hours of athletic trainer may speak well to why uh, the Michigan uh, uh, football team does so well, They're, they have such well-trained athletic trainers. Uh, I don't know what it is in Texas, but perhaps that's why Baylor uh, does so well. Football, great athletic trainers who spend a lot of hours learning that. But the issue here is, one, uh, here you have individuals who are dealing with life and death, relatively few hours and days of, of training, and other ones, who, others who who certainly are, may be important and certainly provide individuals with services, but uh, perhaps less so in terms of life and death. So one uh, other issue is that licensing reduces interstate migration. So it not only serves as a barrier to get into the occupation, but if you're moving from state to state, it really serves as a barrier. So for teachers, it's really tough to go from one state to another. And this became a big issue in the last administration. Michelle Obama uh, 
uh, was visiting Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina, and ran into someone who was being transferred to Fort Ord in California. And uh, his wife was going to go along with him. He, she was teaching in North Carolina and wanted to become a teacher in California. Rather than being able to move from North Carolina to California, she would have to go back for a year and a half and take classes. Uh, what happened and what got Michelle Obama very interested in this was that they had to go on food stamps because his earnings was, were so low and she could not work in California where she could work in North Carolina. And uh, the argument was, well, you know, the California math is a lot different than North Carolina math. So uh, they had to relearn that. So, but, but this has led, uh, the, the orange line is the growth of occupational licensing. The green line is the decline in interstate migration. So as licensing has grown, the ability and the, the opportunities to move across state lines without paying a very high cost, that is going back to school and going back for a year and a half, got to go to private school, got to be out of the workforce, those are huge costs of going across state lines. As a result, and we've shown for a number of occupations that this really serves as a significant barrier. In fact, I'm going to be talking about this to the economics department tomorrow. So uh, what happens in terms of the difference between uh, migration rates of workers in the most and least licensed occupations? So uh, this is uh, what happens uh, in, in terms of the most and least. So the, uh, those people who are uh, licensed the, the most uh, tend to move about the same within a state. And the blue line is how much less they move across states. So the blue lines suggest that people who are the most licensed tend to move a lot less relative to the average, zero being the average, than uh, those individuals who are uh, licensed, but they, they move within state like everybody else, maybe slightly less. Uh, but the people who are licensed tend to move across state lines dramatically lower than the people who are least licensed. So again, licensing serves not only as a, bar a barrier to get into the occupation, it serves as a barrier if you find an opportunity uh, to go from Texas to California, uh, you're going to have to do a lot more additional work in order to be a worker in California. Uh, also, licensing raises prices. Uh, this, this is a study done by the, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. They looked at, a, they summarized a bunch of studies and they found uh, overall licensing, occupational licensing raises prices. No shock there, it raises wages 10 to 15% and it, it raises uh, prices somewhat less in the six to 8% range. So uh, the, the effects of licensing are to, to raise wages and prices. Uh, does it have any effect on quality? Uh, the, the results so far suggest uh, if it does, it's fairly modest. And there's some new challenges in ride sharing. Uh, as Dr. Bradley mentioned, I'm uh, currently doing work with Uber, and they, this is a big issue for them. Uber, uh, the, the uh, appraised market value of Uber is about uh, $63 billion. This is a company that did not exist in 2010. Uh, it, uh, right now, if you consider, consider ride-sharing people to be employees, uh, Uber does not consider them employees, but if you consider them employees, Uber is the third largest private sector employer, quote, uh, in, in quotation marks, in the US, right behind Walmart and McDonald's. So this is a company uh, that uh, when you were in, starting high school didn't exist and now it's one of the largest private sector quote employers a ride sharing they they're contractors or they share the app whatever you want whatever uber would like to call them and what we're looking at is what happens when uh, ride sharing workers or ride sharing providers of service are required to have a taxi license what happens to the composition of the workforce well 
It reduces the number of part-time workers, less college students can serve as Uber drivers, less retired people serve as Uber drivers. There's just a lot fewer people who can provide those services. Surge pricing goes up uh, so that you have fewer workers in the night, number of times that Uber can charge more uh, the, when there's high demand relative to supply. Uber is a microeconomist. Prices go up. Uh, and what happens to safety and quality? Uh, the, uh, I know there's a great Saturday Night Live skit in terms of people trying to get, everyone trying to get a rating of five, the customer trying to get a rating of five, the driver trying to get a rating of five. How do they collude? Uh, so you got, every, you got to get the five. In fact, about 10% of Uber drivers are, uh, are lose the app uh, because uh, they don't get high enough ratings. And there's the issue of safety. Uh, what happens uh, when Uber drivers are compared to taxi drivers, high and low regulated uh, 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 drives, and there's very little difference. Uh, and the whole issue of, ta of, of taxi licenses and the, and the potential effects on what's called the gig economy. Everyone's, rather than working for an employer, everyone does a gig. You can work for Uber, you can work for Lyft, or you can be a taxi driver. That's the gig. So what's happening? What are the implications when this particular occupation is regulated and you can't provide the service without the permission of the government? Interesting and important issue as the economy is changing. So what's happening across countries? So I've got Canada, uh, the UK, uh, the European Union, uh, and China. So all these countries are faced with occupational licensing issues. So this is not only a parochial US issue, it's really an issue that's, that's being uh, adapted and, and looked at around the world. Uh, so licensing uh, has been a big issue in the UK. I did a study of licensing in the UK, uh, and there's a huge variance, about 14 to 33 percent of the European Union uh, economy has attained a license. In the UK, there appears to be some growth in licensing that is very similar to the US. They're somewhat behind us in terms of their growth rates, but not too far behind. Uh, if you look at licensed occupations, uh, countries like Denmark have about Denmark and uh, Sweden have between 14 to 15 percent of their workforce is licensed. Germany has 33 yeah, percent. If I were giving you a quiz, does this look like any other country? Well, if you think of countries like states, it's sort of like Iowa and South Carolina. Uh, Germany has about three times the percent licensed that Denmark and Sweden. Uh, is Sweden uh, has very little licensing. Are they in a terrible economic straits? Probably not. Uh, Germany uh, has lots of licensing. It's very hard to move across jobs, very hard to access and move across jobs in Germany, but they're doing pretty well. The UK is about, United Kingdom is about 19%. And this is sort of, it gives you a picture of Europe. A lot of the licensing tends to be in Central Europe. Germany uh, and uh, Slovakia and other countries, Ireland tends to be a bit more licensed. The lighter countries, the, are the light red ones or pink ones, tend to be less regulated. In some countries like the Netherlands and Finland, even lawyers are not required to be licensed. Uh, so what's the effect? Uh, there are about 22% of the a European Union is required to have a license. The wage premium is somewhat lower because uh, a lot of these people are funded to go to school. I guess going to Baylor, I wish, I'm sure many of you wish someone was funding your education. But in Europe, a lot of the education is free. Uh, so there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of restrictions on licensed occupations in terms of what they can charge from doctors to lawyers. So the, the prices can't go up as much. So there's uh, much less wage inequality. Consequently, uh, there's not as big an effect of licensing uh, in terms of wages in Europe relative to the US, but it really doesn't seem to reduce inequality in Europe. I want to give you a little story of what's going on in the Netherlands to sort of to, uh, to say what, how does licensing work. 
The, Ju the Dutch government for many years had a quota on the number of people who could get into medical school. Uh, and they had a lot more people who passed the exam to get into medical school than there were slots. So the Dutch government, wanting to be fair, said we're going to engage in a lottery. So we're going to pick uh, Jane gets to go to medical school, Joe gets to go to medical school because their ball was picked out of an urn. Everyone else, even though you had a good enough grades to go to medical school, you had to go find something else to do. So the question is, what happened to the people? They could fire, uh, look, and because they kept their social security records and you can check on them, what happened to the earnings of the people who won the lottery versus, that is, they got into medical school, and the people who didn't who had to become PhD scientists or pharmacists or do something else because their ball wasn't picked in the lottery. So what happened is that uh, the people who couldn't, or their number wasn't picked, uh, made between 20 and 50 percent, 20 percent uh, less immediately and up to 50 percent less 22 years later after first applying to medical school. So these are all people who want to go to medical school. There weren't enough slots. They limited the supply because it's a licensed occupation. They couldn't go out and hang up a shingle and say, come, come uh, with your runny noses or your flu symptoms. Uh, they couldn't practice because in, in the Netherlands, like the US, you need a license to practice. Uh, but the ones who were lucky, made about 50% more 22 years after they won the medical lottery. Uh, so monopoly rents uh, were a reason for these people doing dramatically better uh, because they, were a, they limited the number of slots in the Netherlands. Well, what's going on in China? China has very similar. They have both certification and licensing. And the effects in China, this is a growing phenomenon as, as their market is transitioning from more command to market driven, a lot of the occupations are seeking to become licensed and the wage effects are very similar to those in the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and the US. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. Well, what are sort of, is licensing good? Is licensing bad? How do different people perceive this labor market institution. Well, former uh, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Jackson, very famous justice during World War II, was also the US uh, prosecutor in, the, in trials in Nuremberg after World War II. Uh, and in a case coming up with fee collectors in the state of Texas, wrote the majority decision that the state may have an interest in shielding the public against the untrustworthy, the incompetent, or the irresponsible. So it's important for you to be protected from these individuals. In contrast, uh, the famous economist, no, the literary person, George Bernard Shaw, in, a, in one of his famous plays, uh, said, all professions are conspiracies against the laity. Uh, so that uh, even economists probably try to conspire uh, to keep things away from the public and keep it within ourselves. Milton Friedman, the famous University of Chicago economist and Nobel laureate, uh, uh, mentioned that professional monopolies that limit the possibility of experimentation, because if you're licensed, you can only provide the service in a certain way. So if you are a plumber, you can only install things in a certain way. If you're using new innovations and someone complains because of those new innovations, you could lose your license. Uh, I work with a company in Minnesota called Ecolabs. They install uh, re uh, refrigerators, large refrigerators, and stoves in hospitals and hotels. When they install those, uh, that, that equipment or when they come and fix it, those people are trained they have to have a licensed electrician or a licensed plumber there. That licensed plumber is sitting and watching the person from Ecolabs install the equipment or fix the equipment, but Ecolabs has to pay that person $100 because it's required that a licensed person be present when that is being installed 
or being fixed. So that raises prices. It reduces the ability to engage in innovative activities by the company. So small differences that matter. What happens to licensing? This is a study we've uh, recently completed looking at what happens to people before they're licensed. The red line are people who are who looking at their wages before they became licensed. For example, occupational therapists recently became licensed. Physical therapists became licensed in the last 20 years. Uh, uh, a number of other occupations such as uh, personal trainers uh, and uh, have become licensed over the last uh, several years. Uh, the red line shows their wages before and the, the, the vertical line is when they become licensed and the red line shows what happens to their earnings afterwards. The black line are people who are never licensed and what happens to them. They make about the same before they were licensed and their, li and their wages increase a little bit but the people who are lucky enough to get licensed really are able to get much higher wages. People who are, and I'm a practitioner, I'm a grandfather, and what grandfathering is, is people who uh, become licensed or, or, or who, when an occupation becomes licensed, if, if let's say tomorrow, economists are required to become licensed. I studied way back when, uh, and, but if economists became licensed, I would be grandfathered in. So I would be automatically licensed. All, when occupations become licensed, all the people who were practicing before automatically get to be licensed. So I would automatically get a license, even though I didn't meet the requirements uh, that are currently in place for economists. I would get a big bump in my pay, even though I didn't do anything other than lobby for economists to be licensed. So, uh, and that's what happens when uh, uh, after an, an occupation becomes licensed, people who are grandfathered in, that is they didn't meet the requirements but they were lucky enough to be there when the occupation become licensed, they get a wage bump. So these are some of the issues. So uh, given all this is happening, I, my, I always tell my kids they something come in and uh, something bad happens and they tell me their problems. I don't want to hear the problem. Tell me the solution and they really get mad at me. Uh, so I'm going to tell you some potential solutions, uh, potential solutions uh, to some of these potential problems. So one is uh, as occupations seek to become licensed, you can require benefit cost analysis. Who's going to be helped? Who's going to be harmed? Uh, and what are, uh, what are, what's the government going to have to pay because less people are, for example, teachers. If there are fewer teachers and there's an increase in demand for teachers, you're going to have to pay more for the current teachers. What's it going to cost taxpayers? If an occupation is regulated, consumers are going to have to pay more. What's the cost? What are the benefits? Are there health and safety issues? Certainly we can think of a, a pandemic if someone wasn't licensed. Uh, so those, those are potential benefits and costs. We need to, to assess those. Uh, when the costs of evaluations are shown to exceed the benefits, requirements should be modified or dropped. So uh, looking through, and the state of Colorado currently requires all occupations to be sunsetted. So uh, every occupation, every several years, needs to be evaluated in terms of whether those, uh, those regulations need to continue. And uh, if the benefits uh, exceed, uh, if the costs in, uh, in increase or the costs are greater than the benefits, they should be modified or dropped. Reciprocity, something I talked about earlier. As much as possible, accept the licenses granted in other states. Certainly, uh, when, I'm, when you're driving from Texas to my state of Minnesota, we will accept your Texas driver's license. Uh, so uh, should those... Uh, occupational licenses be accepted as well. Nurses have a 36 state compact. So if you pass, become a, li a licensed as a nurse in one state, 35 other states will allow you to practice as a nurse. So as much as possible to reduce these barriers to mobility that we talked about earlier and that Michelle Obama saw as being onerous in terms of the military
being, to move, being able to move across state lines. And uh, certification. Certification or less or other less limiting policies. Remember what certification, again, if I were giving the quiz, a certification is a right to title. That is, yes, you can say you are a certified financial analyst. Uh, so you have passed certain exams, you have gone through certain training, you are going to be a Baylor graduate. So you have, men you have passed certain requirements. You have the right to use that as a title, but in licensing it's a right to practice. So it allows for competition, but it also allows individuals to hold themselves up as having met certain criteria. So that as much as possible, use certification which allows for competition, allows for innovation, uh, reduces the fencing out both in terms of getting into the occupation as well as moving across state lines, certification might serve as a nice substitute for licensing. So I thought I would conclude with a licensing fable. Right? You, I'm sure your parents read you bedtime stories. Well, I thought I would conclude with uh, since most of you are still awake, this may help put you uh, in, your, in the bedtime mood. Uh, so the, so the, the story is the following. An occupation comes to the governor of the state and says the following. Governor, we are here to protect the good citizens of the state of Texas. Uh, and we think it's important that we, we protect the good people of the state of Texas against incompetent and unscrupulous providers of the service. The governor, from long years of experience, says, are you here to protect the people of the state of Texas, or are you here just to capture monopoly rents, restrict individuals from entering the occupation? And the member of the occupation usually says, we're here to do a little of both. So uh, the occup So one thing to watch out for is the restriction versus protection of the people of the state. Thank you for your attention.